tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome, dear listener, to Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Set aside some moments now and take an adventurous ride on a journey into the psyche of some talented writers. They will dig into your being and titillate you. Oh, I love that word, titillate. While the stories may not all take place in the heartland, I am delivering them to you from the heartland. My intention is to strike fear and confusion into the mind, soul, and yes, the heart. This is Fear from the Heartland. Greetings, Heartlanders. Welcome to week three of Fear from the Heartland. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley. Two titillating stories tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Titillate. Sorry, I digress. Two scary stories tonight. The first dealing with a castle, a king, and a hero. The second tale? Zombies. Heath Path and Ashley Fontaine bring their writing prowess to us tonight. Hope they have somewhere to go, because this shit is about to get real. Not sure if they have a padded room to get to, but you know I do. <laughs> Let's get after it. Tonight's story, The Wizard King, is written by Heath Path. By the way, I pronounced Heath's last name correctly, Paff, P-F-A-F-F. -F -F. The first F is silent, not the P. I mean, really, there's three freaking F's in his name, only makes sense one of those F's should be silent. The first one was elected. Damn, I'm tired, I need a nap. Back to the padded room for me. Oh wait, hell, the Wizard King. Guess I better give you an idea of what you're about to hear. And this is a cool story. When a master of dark magic moved onto the hill and claimed the area as its own, no one stood up to turn the monster away. It cost seemingly little to have the shadow draped across the land and the Wizard King, as it called itself, even promised to grant the wishes of those who would brave its tower for a meeting. The negatives could be ignored. In fact, the wizard's power was such that the people feared it and took its demands upon them as a matter of course. Climbing the tower was a challenge left for only the most foolhardy. Getting a wish granted or a question answered by the tower's keeper was a task none had yet succeeded in. But that didn't mean that no one was willing to try. Thus begins our hero's journey up the wizard's tower. And now, for your indulgence the Wizard King. I need to see the Wizard King, I told the wraith who guarded the King's Tower. The entity observed me, standing motionless near the door it guarded. The human elements were wrapped in gray cloth that seemed to sway as though floating in water, tugged at by ethereal currents that I could neither feel or see. Places where flesh was exposed showed a body that had been eaten away by attrition. Bones show through its decayed face and arms. The hollow eyes bored into me, cutting as deep as any blade ever could. Creatures such as these, tarnished souls forced back into physical form could kill with a touch if they desired. Their hollow eyes were known to freeze men in place. I could feel that weight upon me. Entering the tower is death. You should return from whence you came. 
Its voice was a tear between our world and the next. A harsh whisper spoken across a chasm not meant to be spanned. I reached into the pouch at my side, fingers dancing over the wooden figurine I'd brought with me. I pulled it from my pocket and held the damned scrap of wood out in front of the wraith. It was a simple carving in the shape of a person. I know why you're here, mortal, but I also know that no one reaches the king's roost. You waste your life. There was no judgment in that voice, just an eternal melancholy that would never find solace. I'm going in, I stated flatly, unwilling to be turned aside. It considered me for a moment as though trying to decide what sort of audacious creature stood before it, and whether or not it should try to put a stop to my entry of the tower. So be it, the wraith finally said. It lifted a hand, inviting me to take it, and I joined my warm flesh to its cold decay. The pain was immediate, a fire starting in my palm and sending shockwaves of agony through me. This was the curse of burning, the price of tower entry. The door behind the wraith opened and the undead creature stood aside. I looked at my palm where a smoldering dot was burning with an unnatural intensity. My time was now falling away like sand through an hourglass. I stepped into the dark. The door shut heavily behind me, the hidden lock engaging. No one could leave that way, but I hadn't come expecting to turn back. The smell of decay wrapped around me, death an odor as familiar as the touch of a passing breeze. The dark sought to hold me firm, but I knew it too well. Another comes, a voice whispered through the darkness. Another fool comes. <laughs> Another voice said, almost on top of the first. It was followed by mocking laughter. Come then, succulent one, come feed us. Whether it was the first or second thing that said this, I couldn't tell, but I knew what they were. I had met their like before. I reached into my belt and pulled out a small wax-wrapped stick. A moment later, I twisted the seal atop the bundle and it burst to life, a dazzling fire that cast back the shadows of the room I was in. Frost fire flares could burn for hours, and I had been certain to bring several with me. Four creatures filled the otherwise empty first floor of the tower, they were the size of small adults, bipedal, with feet that ended in splayed claws. Gray skin marked them as creatures that were not accustomed to the sun. Their arms were proportional to their size, but their hands were large, ending in razors made for rending flesh. They had large, long heads, most of the front of them taken up by a mouth that seemed to imply the main purpose of their existence was consuming flesh. This was true. They were yattering, abyssal predators that lived to feed. They could only exist in our world when held in place by powerful curse magic. Each one required the life of an innocent to be torn from the abyss. These four represented four lives stolen, and that wasn't including the human remains that lined the floor and walls of the chamber I was in. Shreds of armored men in varying states of decomposition were all around, though most of the skeletons had been gnawed to the barest scraps. The yattering hissed as the light splashed through the room. It brings light, one creature whispered, its mouth not moving. Yattering spoke their vile words directly into your mind. Kill it, another growled into the recesses of my brain. There were echoing sentiments from the others, but I didn't wait for them to get through their distress about the light. I pulled the war axe from my back and launched myself into the creatures. The burning in my palm was getting worse, reminding me that I only had a limited time to do what I needed to do, and this was just the first floor. Blood guts broken bone. Sending a yattering back to the abyss wasn't easy. Sending a pack of four back was almost impossible since the moving ones could reassemble those that had been broken. When I finally finished, I was breathing hard standing in the midst of a great circle of blood and guts. The heads were off in one corner, the rest of them as far in the other direction as I could get them. The bodies still twitched to move, but not with enough intelligence to do anything meaningful. The first floor was done. I had nine more to climb. 
I grabbed my burning brand and started upwards. The stairs were stone, like the walls, like the ceiling, like every piece of this place. It was less a tower home and more like a tower prison, each floor designed to hold some magical horror, another guardian for the man at the top. On the second floor, I dispatched a succubus and incubus pair. On the third floor, I met a pack of necro wolves and had to stop long enough to burn the bodies of the beasts lest they rise again and track me up the tower. Unlike the Yattering, they could regenerate on their own without the need to recover their pieces. On the fifth floor, I was forced to face and fight a dozen children of the forest cannibals. Elves once, but now mad, driven that way by the corruption of the elder forest gods. I dispatched them all, but not before they took the pinky from my burning hand and bit off a chunk of my leather armor. They were not immortal, and they were starved, so the fight was easy before the numbers and the toll it took on my conscience. Even as dark and jaded as I had become, I couldn't ignore the fact that I was dispatching children. On the sixth floor, I met an old man by a fire that had been set in a hearth, the closest thing to furniture that I had seen so far. He sat upon the floor, tucked inside of a battered blanket. My marked hand was all but useless, the burning spot having consumed much of my palm and rendered my fingers to ashes. You've come far. No mortal has ever come to my heart before. But you have four more floors ahead of you, and you're short a hand. Are you sure you wish to go further? You could come and sit by my fire, and I would soothe your pain and let you go free of this place. His voice was dry and raspy, world-worn and tired. I'm passing through here. I said firmly, lifting my axe in my good hand. You know what that means, right? To move past me, you must kill me. The next floor only opens once you have finished the challenges of the current. Are you so determined that you would kill a man who has done you no harm? He hunched forward, as though unable to keep himself sitting fully upright. I would, I told him. But we both know you are not harmless, nor are you a man, though you fit yourself into one here. The old man tilted his head at me. I'm not certain I see your meaning. If not a man, then what do you think I am? My memories shifted back to comfortable times in a house where I bore no responsibility. My mother baked away the shadows and my father filled the evenings with stories. Now I respun one of those stories. Back when my father was a young man, there were fairy creatures who stole into the houses of children at night. The fairies sent the children fond dreams and in exchange took from them loose teeth. They left a copper coin on every pillow as a marker of their passing. But they did the children no harm and their service was appreciated. Oh, I think I know this story. Go on, said the old man. When the gods of the forest went mad, their pollution took hold of all fae creatures, including these kindly fairies. What happens when a tooth fairy goes mad with curse? I asked, shifting my axe up to my shoulder. What indeed? The man asked, tilting his head to the side. His skin seemed to slide across his face, distorting his features. My father called them skull fairies, but I've heard them called other things since. Changelings, skin thieves, butcher fairies. I shrugged. Many names, same basic monster. Loves to kill its food, rip off the outer layer, and then wear it around. The old man stood up, and up, and up. His head scraped the ceiling, the human flesh ripping on the stone. Flesh and clothing tore away as the blanket fell from his shoulders and it removed the pretense of humanity. You should have come to the fire. You would have died faster. The chittering thing that had been in the old man was insect-like, but narrow and tall. Its body was covered in limbs as long as arms that had been tucked and folded away. The curse had twisted its fairy body into something monstrous. 
By the time the last scrap of flesh was falling away, I already had the first swing of my axe launched. The blade clove into a section of its torso, causing it to rear back and scream. I continued the force of the blow and swung the axe back up to hit the monster in the face. I cut deep, but I didn't stop there. Its arms were slashing at the air with unnatural strength. I struck again and again as it tried to pierce the armor I was wearing. It tried to fall atop me, but I dropped my axe and punched through one of the gouges I had made in its flesh, reaching the creature's black heart and crushing it. It convulsed and then collapsed heavily atop me. I rolled the corpse off of me and staggered to my feet. Below my wrist on the burning side, all of my hands was blackened flesh wrapped around charred bone. Four more... I growled, recovering my axe. My voice was ragged with pain. On floor seven, I killed a plague griffin while dislocating my bad shoulder and shredding most of the backplate of my armor. On floor eight, I fought a pair of undead knights, bearing the sigil of the Lord of the Damned, and when I finally removed the head of the final fell thing, I tossed it to the ground and crushed it beneath my boot. Their swords, edged in cursed magic, rotted the leather from my armor straps and left rust on my axe. Then on floor nine, I came to the final boundary. It was the door itself that stood in my way. The imposing portal was made of ancient wood, carved from frame to frame in a mural depicting the fall of the ancient city of Cavris to the hordes of the Hungry Queen. Millions died, becoming meat for the demonic legion and feeling the cursed magic of their fell matriarch. This door was a thing I had never seen before. I approached it cautiously. The scene between the two panels was difficult to make out in the intricate carving. There were no handles or obvious points to hold. I hefted my axe and swung it with all my might at the place where the doors should split and the blade hit as though striking an anvil. The reverberation numbed my fingers and caused me to stagger backwards a step. Raw force wasn't going to work. I dropped my axe to the ground and stepped towards the door again. Closing my eyes, I became still for a moment. I could feel the shifting of the air near the door, the crackle of magic that poisoned the world through its existence. I could smell the rancid corruption of dark magic. This door was more than just a door. I carefully reached out my good hand and touched the wood. It was cold, and a feeling of revulsion washed through me. I gripped my teeth and pushed against the door with my hand. The world around me vanished, and suddenly I was standing amidst a city being devoured. I could smell the char of burning bodies and hear the screams of those who had expected their walls to keep them safe. I was lost in the horror of a memory made real, and then I knew what the door was. It was an artifact of Cavris, some ancient wood salvaged from the fallen city and repurposed into the final portal. Dark magic had been performed to draw the horrors of the city's final moments into the wood and lock it in place, creating an object that could ensnare those foolish enough to touch it without an understanding of its nature. Most would be lost in the illusion, doomed to stand in place and suffer the horror of the fall of Cavris over and over again until they finally succumbed to thirst, or perhaps some denizen of the tower. I knew these traps for what they were. My mind was trapped, but my body knew the way to freedom. On instinct alone, it pushed forward, breaking the seal on the door and stepping through the last boundary between me and the Wizard King. As I passed the doorframe, the vision of the city fled. I walked up the last stairs and came up into a large room, one impossibly sized to fit atop the tower. This was a hollow space. I knew immediately. A magic realm created by the will of the wizard. The whole tower was a part of this, but this floor was the one where the magic was strongest. This place was a threat unto itself. The size of it was a testament to the power of the being who controlled the space. No one has made it here before. A voice spoke to one side and I turned to face it. I had seen wizards before, though none so strong as this one. They were always unsettling creatures, they began as human mages, magic users who pursued the arcane in an effort to help their fellows. 
but some of those mages lost sight of their goals and became hungry for more and more power. A human body can only contain so much arcane magic. Most of the greater magics were tainted by the curse, and tapping into them meant surviving a constant struggle with corruption. Wizards, though, had discovered a way around this limitation. If a human body was weak, then why restrict yourself to flesh? The first step in going from mage to wizard was the shedding of the human prison. The wizard that spoke to me now was one of the most horrifying examples of that shedding I'd yet encountered. Many sought to make their new forms look somewhat like the one they were leaving behind. This wizard had clearly not cared. Its head was a wedge of rusted metal with articulated jaws crammed full of jagged metal teeth. This wedge sat atop a bipedal frame with long metal arms that ended in three-fingered hands, all of it articulated with more joints than any living creature I'd seen before. It could move these limbs in impossible directions. Some parts of it were wood, most were metal, but there were chunks of bone in places as well, and I was aware that there were stretched sheets of human flesh covering parts to its chest and legs, leather accents to the rest of its horror. Inside that frame would be a human heart and brain, though tucked deep inside in places no weapon could penetrate. You survive the climb, mortal. I will grant you one boon, as is the law of the tower. I knew it could see me, though it had no eyes that I was aware of. I took a step forward, reaching into my pocket to pull out the wooden figurine. I tossed it to the ground at the Wizard King's feet. One of its arms stretched to the ground, bending and writhing down to pick up the figure. It picked up the piece of wood, rolling it over in its three-fingered appendage. This should have been turned into your village elders. It would have gotten you a large sum of coin. Its voice was metallic, as though rolling up from the inside of a suit of armor. It dropped the figure, then stepped forward and crushed it under a tri-toed metal foot. Yet you return your blessing to the one that gave it to you. Do you seek to offend me? Give me back my daughter. The fire of my anger burned deep and hot. Her life was paid for, the king answered quickly. I never agreed to this. Give her back. I growled the words back at the monster. You live within my domain, mortal. That is all the agreement that is needed. The protection of my magic has a cost. I am benevolent, and in exchange for what I require, I leave you with a significant sum of coin. This is how it has always been. If you did not like the laws of my land, perhaps you should have lived elsewhere. It stood up taller, towering a full foot and a half over me. I had known the Wizard King's lands worked this way. Even when I had settled in them ten years earlier, I had known this risk existed. But like a fool, I had assumed that this creature would never come for my family. I had allowed for this evil to thrive and taken no action against it because this problem had not been mine. And now, I paid for that. I have earned my boon. I spoke firmly. Give me back my daughter. Your daughter is long dead. Would you have her back as a wraith? Perhaps I should drag her essence from beyond the veil and string it to a corpse. Is that what you want? <laughs> he laughed. I am a fair man. Make a reasonable request and I will grant it. Perhaps you would like the curse of burning removed from you? He glanced at my shoulder that was smoldering, my arm mostly burned away now. I barely noticed his words. A deep pit had opened up inside of me, a darkness of pain and rage so deep that I felt it consuming me. I reached up and unfastened what remained of my chest plate. I wanted to collapse and scream, to roar my despair to the sky. The image of the last time I had seen my daughter playing in the garden danced through my head her smile like a dagger in my stomach, twisting. Well, what is it you want? It asked. 
As my chest plate hit the floor, I reached up and grabbed the pendant on my neck. My father once told me that a man who will not stand up to evil because it does not yet touch him is a man who does not deserve to keep that which he loves. He was right. It's easy to forget the voices of those that came before you when you just want to live in peace. You are trying my patience. What is it you want? It snapped its metal jaws at me. I want you to listen, I told it. I want you to understand what you have done and what is going to happen now. The Wizard King sighed and stepped back, slumping into a chair at a desk. Then speak. Tell me what you think is going to happen. My father was a man of many stories and all of them built upon his journey through life. Stories, legends, these are the cornerstones of what makes us who we are. All families have stories they pass on. Mine more than most, I think. My voice I kept calm, but inside I was a broken ball of chaos, filled with an insurmountable rage. I undid my pauldron on my ruined left arm and shrugged it to the floor with a grunt. You see, by the time I was growing up, most of my father's people were already gone. Even my mother was dead. He couldn't stress how important it was that I learn the tales of my people, that I understand what it meant to be a man of my lineage. There was a responsibility that came with who we were. I pulled hard and snapped the necklace from around my neck. It was a small vial that I always kept with me. I popped out the cork and drank the foul-tasting liquid inside of it. Immediately, I could feel it ravaging the insides of my body, peeling back the work of the serums I had taken to make myself normal, to allow me to live as a human. Where is this going? The creature before me asked, suspicion creeping into its voice. What are you doing? Magic crackled in the room, it sent heavy on the air, and I felt the pressure of cursed energy wrapping around my good arm and around my legs as a maddened smile split my face. The bones in my spine began to pop as the muscle along my spine expanded and stretched and the vertebrae began to grow. The pain was excruciating as I became taller. I should have come for you when you first came into my lands. My voice was a growl, deepening as my jaws began to snap and pop, the human skin on my face tearing. Werewolf! The king cursed, standing up and pulling his power to him. Glyphs lit up on the ground, circles of protection sending pale green light up into the room. I watch for your kind. How did you get past Wraith? It will not let your filth into the tower. My good arm snapped and stretched, my fingers turning into talons as the arm on the other side of my body ripped from the burned off stump, quenching the spell fire that had been burning in the empty socket. I laughed darkly. <laughs> we were once werewolves, but that was long, long ago. We have grown beyond those bounds. I roared with the last of my human voice. I stepped through the bounding circle around me, the spell's light flickering out as I stepped through it. No! The Wizard King yelled as he realized what I was. Werewolves were resistant to magic, but I wasn't a werewolf. My kind had come from werewolves, bred for power and strength against our will until we broke free of our human keepers. Despite our treatment, we turned on the darkness and joined humanity in quenching the curse-born demons of our world. We were the war cult, and very few of us still remained. I walked across the distance between myself and Wizard King as he backed away, pulling his dark magic to him. Undead things began to rise from wells of light around him, but I broke them to pieces as they got in my path. One shoved an old sword into my side, but the blade barely penetrated, and I batted the creature away, closing the distance to my prey even further. Stop! He commanded in a roaring voice. I can give you your daughter back! Lies. I had known she was gone when I left my home. I had known she was dead when I passed the wraith. This trip had never really been about getting her back, as badly as I wanted exactly that. 
This was about revenge. This was about doing what I should have done years before. I had tried so hard to forget the words of my father, to forget the part of me that was born for war. But creatures like me never really escape. We fought until we died, and loving anyone was always dangerous for that person. It had been true for my wife, and now my daughter was gone. And fate had reminded me that none of us ever got away. The wizard threw fire and lightning, cursed me, and tried to bind me to the ground. But I shrugged off the magic. Finally, I reached him, and then I rent him asunder, pulling his mechanical pieces apart and crushing them into rubble before I grabbed his metal skull and folded it between my clawed hands. The crush of the soft flesh within ended the struggling and quieted the magic of the tower. I dropped the few pieces of the wizard that were left and turned to watch this magically created realm fall to shreds until none of the room I'd been in remained. I stood in a bare tower, holes broken in the walls. The whole structure seemed to sway lightly in the breeze. The only evidence that remained of my fight was the broken body of the Wizard King. I threw back my head and howled at the emptiness that clung to me. I howled for my daughter and for the life I had tried to have. It was done, and I was alone and empty. I hope you enjoyed The Wizard King, as written by Heath Paff and performed by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley. To find more from Heath Paff, please visit simplyscarypodcast.com backslash path, spelled P-F-A-F-F, and you'll be redirected to his author profile on our horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find ways to follow him on his website of foxesmind.com. That's O-F-F-O-X-S-M-I-N-D.com, as well as a link to his work on amazon.com by clicking his Amazon link on that profile. A small portion of your purchase goes to us here at Chilling Tales, where we are proud Amazon affiliates to help make this show possible. In tonight's second featured story, two close friends out deer hunting in remote woods in Arkansas make a gruesome discovery, forever altering their lives in a split second. And now, without further ado, hunting season ends. Saturday, December 22nd, 2 p.m. Sean Kilpatrick loaded up the trophy buck, securing it to the back of the four-wheeler. Wiping a light sheen of sweat from his forehead, he chuckled at the unpredictable Arkansas weather. One minute it was below freezing, and the next warm enough for shorts. Taking off his gloves, he finished tightening the rope, thrilled his fingers were no longer frozen. A smile tugged at the corners of his mouth. Emmett Jeffries would be so jealous when they rolled up to camp. The 12-point catch was Sean's last tag for the season. Jeffries had yet to shoot one. What's so funny? Jared Starkson asked. Just thinking about how irritated Emmett will be, I won our bet. He hates losing. Jared's laughter reverberated through the quiet woods, only to be drowned out by several planes screaming overhead. Both men looked up, watching the strange spectacle. Sean silently counted twenty. Huh, wonder what's going on? Jared shrugged his shoulders. Looks like they came from the Jacksonville Air Force Base and are heading toward Dallas. Awful close to Christmas for practice maneuvers. You have no sense of direction. That's south. Sean pointed the direction of the planes. Dallas is west of here. That's why some nerd invented GPS. Jared deadpanned. You know, Jeffries ain't gonna pay up. The man's tighter than a virgin's asshole. True, but it ain't about the money anyway. At least not for me. 
I enjoy pissing him off. Yeah, I get that. You ain't changed none all these years. You're worse than an old woman holding on to a grudge for something that happened ages ago. Sean snorted. You'd be singing a different tune had Emmett forked your prom date. And in your own car. Probably. The difference between the two of us is I wouldn't still hang out with the loser after, what, over 20 years? Oh, and I wouldn't be a cop either because I'd have a felony arrest record for assault after beating the fucker to a pulp. Yeah, you would, Sean chortled. I, however, enjoy tormenting him every chance I get. Mental scars last much longer than physical ones. Jared shook his head while climbing onto his four-wheeler. Ah, the age-old, my dick is bigger than your dick game. Gotcha. Since we're on the subject of tormenting others, will you please explain to me why you haven't kicked Craig out of the hunting club yet? I mean, we're risking a lot by having him here. What if he slipped and brought some shit here? We would lose our jobs. You really suck as a friend sometimes. Sean frowned. Craig lost his way after the sudden death of his wife. Would you still be as harsh with your criticism if he opted to hit the bottle like you tend to do rather than snorting coke? Doesn't matter because that ain't what happened. Booze is legal to buy. Coke ain't. We're cops and he's a lawyer. We all know better. End of story. Craig's been clean for six months. Stop worrying. He needs the support of his friends, not condemnation. Will you use that same argument with the chief? If so, I guarantee you it won't work. You gotta let that thin skin of yours toughen up and stop being so nice to others who can fuck up your world in a flash. That's why after we get back to camp, I'm heading home. Already got enough meat for the rest of the year. I don't want to tempt the fates any longer. Craig's a liability. Your choice, not mine. Sean settled on his own machine after taking a picture of the buck. He clipped over to Facebook to upload it, but nothing happened. The little blue ball in the corner continued to turn. Damn woods, no cell service. You and social media, you're almost as obsessed with it as you are with Marion. Oh, and speaking of her, what's going on with you two? Rumor around town is your unit's been seen at her office several times during the last week. Please tell me that's not true. I can't take any more of your bitching about her shenanigans. Sean grimaced at the mention of his estranged wife. Gee, and I thought to be able to vent is what friends are for. Guess I was wrong. As I mentioned, your friendship skills are sorely lacking. Give me a break. I've endured way above my quota of listening to you dissect your relationship. You married fools are the reason I've stayed single. After she cheated on you and got knocked up by another man, you said the marriage was over. What's changed now? Did she learn how to give a better blowjob or agree to a three-way? Watch it, Starkson. A flame of anger ignited in Sean's gut. That's my wife you're talking about. We're working things out. We have no choice. There are always choices, Sean. Jared raised an inquisitive brow. What? Oh, shit. Please tell me it ain't yours. The anger from seconds ago dimmed as Sean recalled the last discussion he had with Marion and her gynecologist. He hadn't told a soul about the results of the DNA test since he found out two days prior. Yeah, it's mine. Oh, shit. Jared's dark brown eyes widened from shock. That does change things. If it were me, I'd have already skedaddled out of town. Believe me, I was so shocked, a kitten could have knocked me over. Sean let out a huff of air. I've convinced myself it wasn't mine. Still sort of numb about the whole thing. Can't believe I'm gonna be a dad. Wow, me either. You're a better man than me. Even if it was my bun in the oven, not sure I'd want to turn on the stove someone else cooked at. Despite the intense subject matter, Sean laughed. His best friend since second grade had a sick sense of humor. 
<laughs> That's why you're the whore dog and I'm the loyal retriever. So when does this little bundle of joy arrive? Due date is January 26th. Oh, and in case you're interested, we're having a girl. Jared let out a low whistle. <laughs> Let's hope she takes after the loyal retriever side of the tree, not the enough Jared. Again, that's my wife and child you're talking about. Gunfire broke the silence of the woods. The sounds of weapons discharging were common during deer season and wasn't the reason they both froze. What transformed the two friends from carefree hunters to concerned cops was the volume of shots fired and the terror-filled screams of grown men. Exchanging glances with Jared, Sean saw the worry he felt on the inside beaming across his friend's face. They fired up the four-wheelers, flying through the woods back toward camp. Sean topped the hill and stopped, turning off his four-wheeler. Jared did the same. Let's go in on foot. They both reached for their rifles and dismounted, creeping through the dense underbrush toward the encampment. Sean and Jared had spent every hunting season in the same woods for over 20 years and knew the area well. The eerie silence made goosebumps stand erect on Sean's neck. No chirping birds or squirrels, not even the usual din of insects. As they picked their way closer, he strained his ears for any sound. The gunshots had ceased, as well as the screaming. The stillness was more terrifying than the noise. Upon reaching the edge of the camp, their original concerns morphed into fear. The camping chairs surrounding the fire pit were overturned, food and utensils left where they had been dropped. Impressions in the dirt indicated a lot of activity. What the hell? Sean muttered. Jared crept over, hand hovering over the ashes. Cold, been out for a while. Stepping over to the front porch, drawn to the disemboweled torso of the 12-point buck Craig Jackson shot earlier, Sean grimaced. The thing had been ripped to pieces and strewn from end to end of the long porch. Nothing was left except skin, antlers, and bone. Glancing up, he searched the area and counted all the vehicles. Sixteen, just like when they left, yet none of their hunting buddies were around. A cell phone lay face up on the ground, the edges coated in blood. Peering closer, he noticed the last number dialed was 911. The front door to the eight-room cabin they all shared was wide open. Several sets of bloody footprints led inside. The bay window had been shot out. Shattered glass glistened in the afternoon sun. All their four-wheelers are still here, too, Jared whispered from Sean's right. Something gold and shiny caught his eye. Then another, and another. The empty shell casings left a trail from the front porch into the interior. Snapping his fingers, Sean pointed. Jared's face blanched at the vast amount of spent ammunition and blood splatter. Both men went into cop mode, sweeping the cabin, keeping their steps tight and quiet as they followed the trail of bullets and blood. When they reached the back door in the kitchen, they were greeted by bloody handprints on the floor, walls, and doorknob. The back door was ajar. Strange chomping sounds filtered from the back porch. Sean recognized the noise first and mouthed, Bear? Jared looked at the amount of blood pooled on the floor and shrugged his shoulders. Holding up his fist, the signal to remain still, Sean took a long step backward and peered out the small kitchen window to get a better view. Fearing his fellow hunters had been victims of a four-legged predator, he needed to see exactly what they were dealing with. And how many. Black bears were abundant in the area, and maybe a family of them had stumbled upon... Time froze the minute his brain registered the incoming signals from his eyes. A wave of dizziness slammed into him so hard he saw double for several seconds. Craig, what are you doing? Unable to contain his thoughts, Sean muttered, No way. Jared took one step forward toward Sean's position. He whispered, What is it? It was the last words Officer Jared Starkson, the 43-year-old best friend of Sean Allen Kilpatrick, would ever say. The second the sentence left Jared's mouth, Craig Jackson leapt into the kitchen, landing on top of Jared. Both men fell to the ground. Jared's gun clattered to the floor. In shock, 
Sean hesitated for a split second before firing. The bullet ripped through Craig's shoulder, but didn't stop him. Jared's screams gurgled to a stop after Craig opened his bloody mouth, latching onto Jared's windpipe. He tore it out with one bite. Jets of red arterial blood shot from the wound, coating Sean, the walls, and the floor. Taking a deep breath, Sean took aim and fired again, this time hitting Craig's thigh. Blood and flesh burst from the wound, but Craig never gave any indication he felt a thing. Jared was no longer fighting to survive. His body convulsed from the enormous loss of blood. Sean knew only seconds remained before he died, so he chambered another round, blowing Craig's head off. The bullet exited Craig's skull and entered his best friends, killing both instantly. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, what in the hell? Sean muttered while staring at the bloody mess in front of him. He couldn't grasp the fact he just killed two of his friends with one shot. The question was answered by the appearance of Frank Wilson's mangled body. Unable to walk since both sets of thigh muscles were gone, Frank pulled himself into the kitchen by grabbing onto the edge of the door. Sean's stomach juices burned up the back of his throat while gaping at the thick smear of intestines and blood left in Frank's wake. Frozen in horror and shock, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Frank's eyes were solid black. Strange, wiggly blue lines reminded him of a road map covered the face and exposed arms. His wits returned after Frank opened his mouth, letting out a spine-chilling growl. On autopilot, Sean raised his rifle and fired. The bullet pierced Frank's skull just above the bridge of his nose. With one last gurgle, Frank's head slammed into the wood floor with a loud thump. Noise outside caught Sean's attention. Stepping over the corpses on the kitchen floor, rifle steady, he looked out the open door. His mouth went limp. A sea of blood and flesh littered the backyard. Fourteen bodies in various states of dismemberment were strewn across the dead dried leaves. The ground gleamed crimson underneath the mid-afternoon sun's rays. The only way he could tell they were his friends and hunting buddies was from their torn clothing. Upon realizing two half-eaten bodies still moved, he was hit with another bout of dizziness. Stepping back into the main part of the cabin, forcing his fingers to quit shaking, he extracted his cell. He prayed the sporadic cellular service worked. It didn't. He was greeted by a robotic droning voice. We're sorry. All circuits are busy. Please try your call again later. That's for landlines, not cell towers, Sean roared into the mouthpiece. With no choice left but to leave and get help, or at least get closer to a functioning cell tower, he pulled the keys from his pocket. Adrenaline pumped throughout his muscles. He burst out the front door, across the yard, and to his truck. Nerves on edge and mind spinning, he fumbled to get the door open. Once inside the cab, he set his rifle in the seat next to him and tried to stick the keys into the ignition. They slipped from his fingers, clattering on the floorboard. Damn it! Bending down to retrieve them, the weird grunting sound he heard Craig mumble earlier hit him. It came from the right. Snatching the keys from the floor, he shoved them into place and the engine roared to life. The growing sense of dread didn't stop him from glancing out the passenger window. Holy fuck! The once familiar face of Martin Lawson stared back at him through the glass, his eyes the same as the others. The ebony nothingness was like staring into the pit of hell. Martin's white cheekbones and the upper part of his teeth, where the soft flesh had been ripped off, sparkled in the sun. The sickening sight was like a magnet, pulling all of Sean's attention to the gore. The pole broke when Martin's bloodied hands slammed against the window with enough force the glass cracked. Enough of this shit, I'm out of here. Slamming the truck into reverse, he tromped the gas. In seconds, he was on the narrow dirt road leading him away from the carnage at Deer Camp. He never let up on the gas and made the three-mile bumpy journey to Highway 270 in record time. The gravity of the unbelievable situation left tears sliding down his cheeks. Inside the quiet cab, he offered up silent prayers for the dead. About four miles, he tried the phone again and got the same results. Willie's pit stop was less than a half mile away. He could use their phone. 
Pushing the Ford F-150 hard, zooming down the empty two-lane highway at over 90, he tried to remain calm, which was impossible. Jerking the wheel, he pulled into the parking lot and slammed on the brakes. He left his truck running, jumped out, and ran inside. Malvern Police official business. Need to use your phone. Sean yelled, looking around the quiet store for an employee. Silence greeted him while making his way to the counter. Hello? Gut instincts, honed from years of being on the force, kicked him right square in the gut. Slowing the pace, he inched toward the counter, eyes scanning the dimly lit interior. Less than three feet away from the cash register, he smelled it. The thick odor of copper and the stink of bowels made him hold his breath. Death. The floorboards creaked underneath his weight. Stepping carefully, he peeked behind the counter. His ragged breath caught in his throat. There wasn't much left of Willie. The old man's snow-white hair looked as though it had been dipped in a can of red paint. The cavity holding his internal organs was nothing more than strips of flesh and rib bones. Clutched in his right hand was a Ruger, a spent shell casing resting near his head, a gaping hole on the other side. God, I hope you blew your brains out before... Backing up, Sean moved over to the cash register where an ancient black rotary phone sat. It had been in the same place since he was a boy. Willie Hopkins was too cheap to purchase a new one. Sean hadn't seen anyone use the old thing in years and hoped it still worked. Picking up the dirty receiver, he winced. No dial tone. A grumble rose from the back room Willie used as the office. After what Sean experienced in the cabin down in Poyan, he didn't feel the need to see what made the noise. He had bet everything he owned he already knew. Racing back to the idling truck, he floored the accelerator and headed toward Malvern. Dead leafless trees zoomed by in a blur as the speedometer neared 100. When he passed the road sign noting Melvern was only five miles, he tried his cell again. Dead air. What in the hell is going on? A thousand thoughts raced through Sean's mind at almost the same pace as the speeding truck. In minutes, he crossed the city limits, hitting the brakes when he came upon a blockade of military vehicles obstructing the entrance to downtown. What in the world? Sean slowed for a better look. A large group of people covered in blood and gore ambled toward the county jail, some in uniform, some not. His touch with reality snapped. Stomping on the gas pedal, he zigzagged around the vehicles, yelling gibberish the entire time, forgetting all about Jared, Craig, Frank, Willie, and the others while dodging the dead. All he could think of was getting to Marion and their unborn daughter. By the time he made it to town, he realized things were much worse than he imagined back at camp. Hundreds of dead bodies and abandoned vehicles littered the streets. While dodging them, he realized the rifle in the seat next to him wasn't near enough protection from whatever was going on. Spotting an empty Humvee up ahead, he pulled up next to the driver's window. Making sure no one, or thing, was close enough to hurt him, he rolled the window down and peered inside. The front seat was covered in dried blood and brain matter. A female in fatigues lay motionless in the passenger seat, half her head in the driver's side, frozen fingers still wrapped around the grip of her weapon. Scanning the rest of the vehicle, he felt a spark of hope. Three fully loaded M4 carbines rested on the middle console, and the keys were in the ignition. Glancing around once more, he made sure he was still alone. Satisfied he had enough time to check, he crawled partially through the opening and turned the key. The Humvee rumbled to life and had a half tank of gas. Slinking back into the cab of his truck, he snatched the hunting rifle and backed up about four feet. After rolling up the window, he shut the engine down, locked the door, and ran to the passenger's side of his new ride. Sorry about this, Sean mumbled to the dead soldier. Wincing at the smell and sight, he gritted his teeth and pulled... Unwilling to just leave her in the middle of the street, he dragged the stiff body to the edge of the curb. A grumble to his right made the hairs over his body stand on end. He knew what it was and felt no desire to look. Running back to the Humvee, he climbed behind the wheel, executed a U-turn, and headed toward Marion's. 
He made it less than 200 feet before the quiet afternoon filled with the faint sound of the EMS siren. He slowed down and felt around for the assault rifles, overcome with the need to have them close and ready. His hand touched an unfamiliar shape. Shang slowed to a crawl, craning his neck to see what it was. A rocket launcher? Why in the world did they... Oh, shit. They planned on... Sean broke out into a sweat when the sound of automatic weapons drowned out the noise of the siren. More planes streaked across the sky. In the clear afternoon sun, he saw the last thing his eyes would ever take in. Bombs falling from the sky. Some weird instinct made him throw his hands over his head as the first bombs hit nearby, making the entire Humvee shudder. Oh, shit. I'm sorry, Marion. I tried. I really did. Hope you enjoyed tonight's story, Hunting Season Ends, written by Ashley Fontaine. Ashley Fontaine is a major writing contributor to Fear from the Heartland. Ms. Fontaine is an international best-selling author and has penned over 23 works in numerous genres. Her works can be found on audible.com as well, including the first two books of the Legion novella series, narrated by me. To find more of her excellent work, check out her website at ashleyfontaine.net. That's Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, Fontaine, F O N. T-A-I-N-N-E dot net or connect with Ashley on Facebook at Ashley dot Fontaine. If you enjoyed tonight's story, hosted by yours truly, Paul J. McSorley, you can search my name on Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for additional previous stories. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks. Available now on audible.com or just visit paulsbooks.net. That's P A U L S B O O K S dot net. You can also find me personally on Facebook and Twitter. And with that, listeners, our weekly journey into the psyche has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight's episode and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host for Fear from the Heartland, Paul J. McSorley. I've enjoyed the titillation tonight. Ooh, there's that word again. Thank you for joining me. Hope to see you again next week at Fear from the Heartland. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.